Girl. Hey dolls, it's me, Wilma Fingerdoo, with another Makeup and Movies. This week, the makeup is courtesy of Martha Grunwald, my Patreoner and viewer from BC, who sent me the Trixie Mattel Bottle Blonde Palette and her Summer of Love Blush Palette. Shut your face. We also are going to be using Trixie Mattel's lip gloss. This one is Prism. It's a little bit of a purple sheen. And we're going to be using some e.l.f. products because I've actually got quite a few of them that I love using. So, the movie, oh, the classic Lust in the Dust starring Divine, Tab Hunter, and Lainey Kazan. It is a classic cult favorite for me. It is a fabulous spoof on Spaghetti Westerns. And if you want to hear more about that movie and see me put all this on my mug, well, just stay tuned. Okay, so it's a hot day here in Toronto and the fans I have are very loud. Well, that's how fans are. They're very loud and my fabulous microphone just picks everything up. So uh, we're going to not have them on during uh, this edition of Makeup and Movies, but there may be sweating. So I'm just warning you now, if there's small children in the room, you might want to get them out now. Um, so the makeup today that we are using, I'm very excited because this was sent to me by uh, Martha Grunwald out in Vancouver, BC. Uh, I'm going to be using some Trixie Mattel products. I've only used one product of hers before, and that was the Daytime Realness Palette, which Martha also sent me. Today we have the Bottle Blonde Palette. We also have the Summer of Love Blush Palette. I'm excited to use those. And I have two different Trixie uh, um, glosses. I have Prism. Uh, oh no, sorry, this is the Prism, the purple one, and this is Mellow Drama. I'm probably going to use this one, but we'll see. Uh, the reason I'm excited to use these, not only is it because it's a new palette, but the Trixie Mattel Bottle Blonde palette is mostly purple, as you can see. It's a, a purpley pink palette, which I think uh, is, is gorgeous. I'm also excited to use the Summer of Love palette palette because I've only been using one blush palette and that's the Fumi Desilu Vold Juvia's Place collab the Queen palette and I love that that's great but uh, with the with the Summer of Love palette there are some gorgeous colors in here look this is how I this is how I am I like to keep my sleeves I don't know why all of my palettes have that but so this is the uh, Summer of Love palette and it's got uh, a really nice deep pink red a very soft pink and then this is a highlighter that is very very shiny uh, this is I can't get over this is I think the shiniest highlighter I've ever had so I'm really excited to use this and the thing I love about this it's got it's the, the it's got almost like a, a pearly pink tone to it it just comes up with a nice flush color so I'm going to use that on my cheeks and my highlight I'm excited to use that. This will be my first time cheating on Fumi and Juvia's place, so don't tell them. Now, before we get going, I just want to point out, this is today's t-shirt. This is Lar de Souza, one of his latest designs. It's uh, Wilma Hirschfeld. It's his take on uh, Hirschfeld's famous uh, illustrations of celebrities all around. One of, his fav one of my favorites of his is... Uh, Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, it just it was a gorgeous illustration. Now, one of the things he was known for in his drawings was writing his daughter Nina, her name into his drawings, and he would often have uh, the, a number in the bottom corner. And it like 19, it meant there were 19 names in the drawing. You had to find Nina 19 times in the drawing. Uh, so it just gave people something to do when they were looking at them. Uh, this has my daughter Wilhelmina Boxfart's name in it three times. So if you have this t-shirt and you haven't noticed that, have a look. I'm also very excited today because I'm using a lot of e.l.f. products. I've actually been trying out a lot of them. I've been given some and I've been just interested in using them. I've been really kind of sticking to Juvia's Place for a lot of stuff. But one of my favorite primers is the e.l.f. Poreless Putty. Now, this isn't for everyone. This is almost like spackle, which at my age I need. So this is excellent. And if you're one of those people which who are having problems with maybe texture or fine lines showing up, especially if you're using a lot of powder. This is great for that. I'm also going to be using my e.l.f. 16-hour uh, camo in white on my eyes just to kind of pump up the volume, as that were. Kelly, in my last viewer mail video, sent me a bunch of the e.l.f. eyeliner pens, 
and the e.l.f. eyelid primers. I'm going to be using these today, and I had said that it was Kelly's husband that sent them because I misread the note. It's Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. So I'm just going to start with uh, the primer. I'm going to put this on in front of you just so we can all experience it together. Now, today's movie is Lust in the Dust from 19... 85. It was released by Wor New World Cinemas, and it stars Divine, Lainey Kazan, Tab Hunter. It's not a good movie. I'm not lying to you. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try and lead you down a garden path here. It is a very schlocky film, but it's meant to be. It is a spoof on spaghetti westerns. It is a parody of that whole genre. In fact. Tab Hunter's character is based on, I think, every Clint Eastwood Western that he's ever done. So that's very, I just thought that that in of itself was very funny. What's interesting about this movie is initially, I don't know if they had planned to have John Waters direct it, but they wanted John Waters to direct it, and he didn't. He turned them down because he didn't write the script. This is Divine's first movie without John Waters. This isn't bad, this concealer. I, I don't, it's, it doesn't feel like there's a lot in here. I don't, it, well, it's not expensive. I'm not going to complain, but it's, um, it goes on all right. It's fairly dry. I don't find it tacky at all, but that's not always what you need with an eye primer. So I'm just taking the purple shampoo for a base. So Tab Hunter is the male lead. And Tab Hunter was a huge, huge matinee idol of the 50s and 60s. He's just stunningly gorgeous. Handsome, 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 uh, rugged, all-American. And he did a bunch of films through this period. He also, in from the 50s into the 60s, did, I think closer to the 60s, a lot of music. He actually recorded a, a single in 1957 called Young Love. It was a huge hit. If you heard it, you'd recognize it. Well, most of you would recognize it. Okay, the old people in the room would recognize it, but it was it was a huge hit. What's funny is that Tab Hunter, although he did a lot of movies and was famous for his movies, the star that he has on the Hollywood Walk of Fame is only for music. He doesn't have one for cinema. This movie is directed by Paul Bartel, who was an actor and a director. He's actually quite famous for being in the movie Eating Raoul, which he developed the script for, was the lead in and directed. And it's a huge cult. His first film was in 1972. It was a comedy called Private Parts. And then he would go on to direct uh, things like Death Race 2000 in 75, Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills in 89. He's done other ones, but those are the standouts. And it's funny because he's not in this movie. He, he tends to be in the movie. He's like Alfred Hitchcock, I guess, on some level. Well, on a grander scale, because he usually plays not just a person from his movies, but... A supporting or lead role so that's something that was different about this film as I said Tab Hunter is in this he and his husband Alan Glaser produced this movie and this is the thing that's interesting Tab Hunter as I say was this matinee idol all through the uh, 50s and 60s virile handsome uh, the studio kept tying him to people like Debbie Reynolds and Natalie Wood and but Tab officially came out in 2005 when he released his uh, autobiography called Tab Hunter Confidential, The Making of a Movie Star. And this was then made years, a few years later into a documentary with him in it. His husband produced it. The other star of this movie, <laughs> well, they're all stars, but the lead uh, in this movie is Divine as Rosie Velez. And if you don't know who Divine is, well, I can't help you. But Divine was John Waters' muse. Uh, Divine was in, I think, almost every one of John Waters' films. In fact, he wasn't, I think the only reason he wasn't in films of John Waters was because he had died, like Serial Mom. But the other thing that's amazing about Divine, she went on to have a music career 
She couldn't sing. I mean, she could keep a tune. Don't get me wrong. She was never off key. And she sings in Less Than the Dust. And her song in Less Than the Dust is one of my favorite parts of the movie. But she's not... She's she's not a singer, you know. You're never going to put on headphones and enjoy a glass of wine while she chirps away type of thing. But despite that, she had a huge career as a disco diva. But as I say, this was her first performance without John Waters directing. And I think it was a good thing for her to not do a John Waters film. In fact, there's a character in this movie called Big Ed. And initially they had cast Edith Massey, who was also a John Waters performer. And Edith Massey had done her screen test, and they'd all but cast her, but she ended up dying very shortly after that. And the director was okay with that. I, I mean, you know, short of the obvious, oh no, who died? But he thought that if Edith Massey and Divine were in a movie, they'd think that John Waters had directed it. So he was not keen on that from the get-go. So the actress that they went with, her name was Nedra Voles, and she was a, a screen actor, but she did a lot of TV in the 80s, early 80s. She was uh, uh, just featured on a lot of shows as like The Ant or The Grandma or the neighbor or some such thing and I mean she's certainly somebody that if you watch TV from that period you will recognize her. The next person that's in this film is Lainey Kazan. Now she's got a long career that's there's a lot of film in there but there's also a lot of Broadway, there's a lot of TV. She was Aunt Honey on Will and Grace, she was Aunt Frida on the Nanny, she was in My Big Fat Greek Wedding as the mom and its sequel. So she plays Margarita Ventura. She owns this cantina in Chile Verde. It's a cantina slash whorehouse, <laughs> but there's only two other whores in it. <laughs> a surprising addition to this cast is Cesar Romero. Cesar Romero created quite a name for himself in Hollywood, in, in the early Hollywood, classic Hollywood of the 40s and 50s as a Latin lover. He was very exotic and sexy and with his dark hair and his mustache. The thing, ironically, he's most known for, the Joker on Batman. And I think it's because people my age grew up watching him on TV as that character, not knowing that he had a film career before. The camp quality of the Batman series from the 60s, I think it went from 66 to 68, was has just outlived itself on so many levels. So many people are fans of that. And what's funny is when I was a kid, I didn't notice this, but I, I certainly did as an adult. But Cesar Romero as the Joker had the white makeup on and it covered his mustache. I didn't know. As a child, I didn't know. I didn't see a mustache. I just saw a clown's face. That's the thing about Cesar Romero for me is that he is, his biggest claim to fame is being the Joker, I think he was the first Joker. I don't think anyone had played the Joker on screen before Cesar Romero. And he did a great job. I mean, he, did, he scared the hell out of me when I was a child, I'll tell you what. He plays in this movie uh, the, the father, the uh, Father Garcia, or Padre as everyone calls him. And he really doesn't do that much. It's a very small character. So it's just, I just... It was nice to see him in it anyway. <laughs> well, I had that fan on. <laughs> Oops. Playing Hard Case Williams, the the protagonist, the the bad guy, the outlaw in this movie, is Jeffrey Lewis. Now, Jeffrey Lewis, I remember him from the Clint Eastwood film, Any Which Way But Loose. And he did a lot of films with Clint Eastwood. He was also in the movie that Clint Eastwood directed, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Rounding out this cast is Henry Silva. He plays Bernardo, who is Margarita's boyfriend slash bouncer slash not so nice guy. He's quick to quick to anger, quick to... to fire his guns. He's just very, very funny. But Henry Salva 
was uh, he always had these characters, these these quirky, odd, bit party characters. He was in the original Ocean's Eleven, which was in 1960. Also in 1960 was the uh, Manchurian Candidate, the original. He was in that as well. So he's had a long career. What ended up happening with him, though, in 1963, he was the lead in a movie, and it was his first time as a lead. And he could totally be a lead, but his looks really lent him towards character acting and playing these kind of one-note people. But this movie, Johnny Cool, came out, or the script was going around, and it involved, like, a gangster, a mobster, somebody who is going around taking names and kicking butt. And they needed somebody who looked like that to play the part, and so he was the lead in it. And he did really well. In fact, he got really good notices. He did uh, incredibly well. Uh, the movie did well. Like, it, it just hit that chord, and it was part of that whole... He ended up moving to Italy and doing a lot of what they call spaghetti criminal films. They were uh, Polizia, Sia... Uh, can't remember the Italian word for it, but they, it was just a genre of film that involved uh, gangsters and criminals. And he actually moved his family to Europe, and I think he was there for almost 10 years making these movies. So there was certainly money in them. And these movies played internationally, so he had an international following. So I think to have him in this role as Bernardo was fun, because he, he really does look like an old boot that's seen some things and done some other things. Do you know what I'm saying? The original title of this movie was The Reverend and Rosie, but they changed it to Lust in the Dust, thankfully. I don't know if I would have seen a, a, a movie called The Reverend and Rosie. It sounds like a sitcom. But they changed it to Lust in the Dust. And what's interesting about that title is that it was a joke title that they used for a 1946 film called Duel in the Sun. And this film just was very lascivious. In fact, it really, really tested the boundaries of the Hayes Code. And before it could be re released, was heavily edited and changed. And they, people that worked on the production or were in the industry kept referring to that movie as Lust in the Dust. Something else that surprised me about this movie was that Lainey Kazan wasn't the first choice to play Margarita. It was Cheetah Rivera, of all people. And I'm not sure if she was asked and, and laughed in their face or was asked and considered it or they just thought, oh, she'd be fun and left it at that but ended up going with Lainey Kazan. But for whatever reason, Lainey Kazan was the one that ended up doing the role. Another name that kind of got bantied around as far as casting was concerned for the margarita role was Shelley Winters. Now in 85 Shelley Winters would have been 65 and I think she would have been too old to play this part. No offense to anybody but I just I think that Lainey Kazan who was 45 at the time was the perfect age because Divine was 40 and they the two characters played sisters long lost sisters but I do feel that Shelley Winters looked more like Divine, and again, no offense, but I think she would have made a more believable sister to Divine. Although I do think that the makeup that they did for Divine and Lainey Kazan certainly made them look related. So this movie starts off, there's this great classic Western voiceover narrative about the hot, 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 hot sun and how hard life is out in the, the West. and. As the camera pans down from this fabulous vista, we see this figure on a donkey. And it's clearly a woman with a parasol over her head, and she ends up falling off the donkey. And this poor donkey, it's not a very big donkey, and she is a big woman. It's divine. And she's having issues with this donkey not being... It just We just got a few more miles to go. She's trying to get to this town, Chile Verde. And she smells water. She's like, oh, water. And she drags the donkey to this little oasis and she starts skinny dipping. And while she's skinny dipping, there's this stranger, a lone gunman, a silent figure, standing just at the crest of this oasis, going through her things. He's holding up her parasol and things. And she's like, put that down. Who are you? And he says nothing. And 
he goes to leave. He's like, are you going to leave me here to starve? And he shoots a bird. <laughs> the bird, I mean, clearly a fake bird, just falls down, stiff as a board. Boom. Doesn't move. Just clunk. Uh, and so she hustles her her butt out of that little lakey, pondy thing. And the next thing is her walking the donkey beside this mystery gunman. And the mystery gunman is Tab Hunter. And we don't know anything about this person yet. She does all the talking. She's just, she even says at one point, he hasn't said two words to her. And she says, geez, you really can pry a girl's secrets out of her, can't you, mister? And she tells him about her narrow escape from Hard Case Williams and his gang. They apparently came across her on the dusty trail and by her account had their way with her for hours and in fact at one point she's just <laughs> sitting there kind of wrapped in whatever piece of clothing she still has near to her as all of these men are all there's maybe five or six of them all kind of asleep and passed out she taps one with her toe care for another go and he's like no no leave me leave me lady and then this one guy is actually a little person it's an equal opportunity gang i guess he starts working his way up Rosie's leg and she inadvertently snaps his neck between her thighs and it sounds like this isn't the first time this has happened for her so she she makes her escape and that's how she ended up being alone out in the desert and now talking to this mystery gunman and they finally come upon Chili Verde and they enter the saloon in town Margarita's there's nobody there, but you can see their people were there. There's half-eaten plates of food on the table, and Rosie, which is Divine's character's name, takes advantage. Is she hungry? So she she starts just eating off of one of the plates, and the lone gunman is staring around, and he all of a sudden he grabs this kid. He's kind of hiding in the corner, grabs him, and has him down on the table. And who? What's going on? Where is everyone? And he says, oh, we thought you, we heard horses. We thought you might be Hard Case Williams and his gang. I can get everyone to come back. I just have to give them the signal. He starts playing the piano and all of these riffraff, just a variety of mostly all men. In fact, I don't think there's any women in this group. This is where we meet Bernardo. He gets all up in this gunman's face. Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you want? They end up having a bit of a skirmish that ends with... Uh, Tab Hunter's character shooting two of his friends, gang members, I don't know. And as he's working his way kind of to the door with everyone at bay with his gun, the saloon door swings open and we see this woman there with a shotgun. This is Margarita Ventura, played by Lainey Kazan. And she says, one more move and I'll be wearing your butthole as a garter. Of course, she doesn't say butthole. She asks the gunman, was it a fair fight? And he said... Yeah, it was an accident. She says, accident? Yeah, he moved. And meanwhile, Bernardo's like, no, no, it was no accident. And she clearly has a history with Bernardo, which is him overreacting and her telling him to calm down, which she does. And she tries to get this gunman's name off of him as well. And he doesn't answer her. But this little old lady comes up to the bar and says, care to buy a lady a drink? And Margarita kind of tells her to, frig off she says if any blind men come in i'll send them your way and abel pushes well not roughly either like takes her by the shoulders and moves margarita out of the way and says to this little old lady i'd love to buy you a drink ma'am and she orders a gin and she says my name's big ed what's yours and he says abel wood <laughs> and everyone it's all on twitter the whole abel what his name is while that's going on, Rosie has approached Marguerite, telling her she's looking for a job. I'm a singer. And Marguerite is just so insulting to her, like just has nothing, nothing nice to say. Rosie takes offense and says, look, I'm not going anywhere until you've heard me sing. So Margarita stops the room. All right, all right, pay attention. And not in a nice way, like she's not being flattering about it. She just, all right, this one's going to sing, people, let's go. And she goes over to the the skinny little redhead that they met initially when they entered the cantina, whose name is Red Dick, on account of my hair, ma'am. And so she says, hit it, Dick. And she sings the song, these lips 
We're made for kissing. And it's a great song. It is a great song. And I say that because Divine sounds awful. No offense to her, but she just is like, these laps. And she hits every note, but she just has this rough voice. It's just very funny. And the whole time that she's singing this song, Margarita's kind of sitting in the back smoking a cigarillo. And <laughs> at the end of the song, she says, honey, you sing like you look. Just fabulous. In the meantime, Abel said, I'm moving on and I'll be doing it alone. So he goes and gets the shower. There's this young woman that works in the cantina. She's half dressed all the time. Looks like her clothes are just about to fall off of her all the time. Her name is Ninfa, N-I-N-F-A, Ninfa. And so she she's following him out to the shower and she says, with or without, he said the shower clothes off. It's just this wooden structure. And he's like, with? And she goes, you would. And she puts a blindfold on. And then she climbs up this ladder with two buckets of water. And she literally is just pouring water wherever his voice is. You know, he asks her, well, how long have you been here? She goes, just a month, but I don't like it. And she says, she alludes to this gold. It's the first we hear of this gold. There's apparently gold in Chile Verde. And he asks her for it. And, she's, and she doesn't, she immediately starts to change the subject and all of that. And while that's all going on, Margarita has snuck out of the cantina and is now looking through the slats of the shower to get a look at Abel Woods, which she does. And then she continues to take off all her clothes and get into the shower with him. And we see this scene where they're kissing and they pan down past the partition to just his... She's not standing on the ground. She clearly wrapped her legs around him. And after his shower, Abel must have still felt dirty because he goes to the local church. This is where Cesar Romero is as uh, Father Garcia, and he confesses. He has he does confession, like it's been quite a long time since his last confession, and he had a lot to confess, and all of his confessions have to do with women he slept with, and the Padre's darning a sock or something while he's confessing, and he keeps stabbing himself. Ooh, you know, I, it's just, at one point he says, there were these two lockjaw Indian, Indian maids. He's, there are no lockjaw Indians. There are two now, and it's just that kind of thing. It's very broad and funny. While that's all going on, Rosie has apparently been hired by Margarita to clean. She's scrubbing the floor. She takes a break and talks to Big Ed and this gold comes up again. So here's the second time we're hearing about this gold. And, and so Rosie, she can't really get much more out of her from that. So she changes the subject and says to Big Ed, keep in mind Big Ed is the tiniest person in the room. She's just tiny. She couldn't be more than three and a half feet tall. And she says to her, divine in her six-foot-tall voluptuousness, says, you got a dress I could borrow? She goes, sure, come with me. And they head off. And as they head off, there's this kind of like caftan on the piano that Red Dick is playing at. And Big Ed grabs it and drags it with them as they go off to her room. So the next scene is Bernardo. And I say it like that because that's how Lainey Kazan says it. I just love it. Anybody that can roll their R's naturally, Bernardo. I can't do it. I have to make a mental effort. Uh, it just impresses me. So Bernardo's whipping the locals into a, a feathered pitch against this gunman who's just there for the gold. And they, they can't put up with that. And they have to make a stand. And, and they, they've reached a fever pitch. So they, they literally, they've lit torches and off they go in search of Abel. He has since left the church and is making sure his horse is okay he's down by the stables and the horse seems slightly agitated and he's like oh what's going on and that's where the mob gets him they get him all tied up and on the back of his horse with a, a noose around his neck meanwhile rosie and big ed are in big ed's room and rosie's almost in like a fully new dress but it's clearly the caftan that was on top of the piano looks good and she's like what's all that noise going on outside and, and big ed's like is it Saturday? And she says, yeah. And he's like, oh, it's lynch night. And, and they're all excited. And then they realize that Abel's being <laughs> is, is the star of the show for the lynch. And, and so Bernardo's got Abel up on the horse. He tries to get the horse. He slaps the horse and it won't go anywhere. It just won't move. He does it again. The horse still won't move. He takes out his gun and goes to fire it to get the horse to start running. And just as he's about to fire it, that we see from a building we're not even sure what building it is a rifle muzzle comes out of a window and just as bernardo shoots his gun this rifle goes off and 
splits the rope of the noose and Abel goes off into the cold, dark night. And the party breaks up. It's like there's going to be no lynching. They're all like, meh, meh. Before Abel left the church, the priest told him not only about the gold, but of a, a limerick. So at some point, the horse stops running. Abel makes his way back to the cantina where he shoots Bernardo. He just like that. He's had enough. Bang. He's down. And Margarita's very upset about this. And she starts to wail. And it's very emotional. And she's like, Run! And then you realize that she's actually singing. And that's where she starts doing her musical number, South of My Border. Let me take you south of my border, just north of my garter. And, and while she's singing, Margarita's sitting on poor dead Bernardo and using his hands, like holding his hands and rubbing her boobs with them. And then she gets off him and he's just dead. He's just sitting there. So Red Dick and Ninfa bury Bernardo. And while Abel's in bed, he gets a couple of attempted visits. One is from Big Ed. She knocks on his door to wish him a good night. And he, and he says the same to you. And, and she says, sweet dreams, and kind of blows him a kiss through the door and frigs off. And then Rosie and Margarita have like a moment together where they're both outside Abel's door. Clearly, they both have the same idea. Margarita goes into her room. And Rosie goes into hers, which is next door to Abel's. And as that's happening, Red Dick is coming back from burying Bernardo and clearly also having sex with Ninfa. And I think he even says to her, oh, thanks. And as he passes Rosie's door, she grabs him and drags him in. And he's like, oh, I've been wanting you since the first moment I laid eyes on you. And they start to canoodle. And that's when... Rosie breaks his neck between her legs. It's terrible. So the next morning, Big Ed is, you know, washing dishes at the bar. Abel comes out and startles her. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. I was just daydreaming. And he's like, what were you daydreaming about? And she talks about how one guy who came into town was from a place called Abilene. And she just thought it was so beautiful. And she says, I just really like the name. And she even sings it. And because she's next to the piano, she plays a few keys. And one of the keys goes dead, like... Ding, ding, burr. And they both look into the piano. It's a stand, it's an upright, so they lift the top. And there's Red Dick dead in the piano. And so Abel gives the guys who are going to bury him some money and to make sure he gets a good burial. And they all kind of frig off. And Rosie is there with Margarita and Big Ed. And they're kind of like, well, who would want to kill? red dick and she says to ninfa did you give him a freebie last night and she's like no no and no one asked ed big ed but she's like well i certainly didn't and and ed says well maybe he solved the limerick rosie's like what limerick and margarita's like don't say anything big ed and this fight breaks out between rosie and margarita and rosie's had enough and she's like you've been picking on me since i got in here and you know what you run a whorehouse a whorehouse and there's only three whores in it. One of them, too old and senile. <laughs> no offense, honey. The other one, too young to know which end is up. And what does that make you? The only whore in Chili Verde. Cheap. This furniture is cheap. And she hits her with a chair. And and they have this huge dust up. It's just big. And they're rolling around in the, the floor of the cantina. And, and the fight spills out outside. They're it, rolling around in the dust. <laughs> and... They realize they're in front of this guy on horseback. It's Hardcase Williams. He's They found Rosie. And she didn't kill the little guy. He's got a neck brace on. And every time he moves, he's like, oh, you know. And, his, and he says that she's going to help them find the gold. And Margarita goes, how do you know about the gold? And she says, I don't know. And clearly they're going to drag her off against her will. And we see Abel come out of the church. He's off with the, the priest again. And... He kind of comes out and stops Hardcase Williams and his gang. They end up having a big gunfight in the center of town. And Abel is able to kill everybody in the Hardcase Williams gang except Hardcase Williams. In fact, they end up having a, a, a fist fight and Hardcase knocks Abel down the well. He just... And it's quite a long drop, too. Rosie sees that. She goes tearing off, afraid for her life, grabs a horse and hits it. And Hardcase Williams goes after her. And, and he corners her out in the desert where he tells her, 
that there's this tattoo on her ass. One of the guys saw it, and they didn't really even bring it up until after she'd left. And he thinks it's a tattoo to the uh, a map to the gold. And she goes, "Well, it's only half a map. It's 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 no good. I've been." trying to find out about this map forever. And while all that's happening, Abel has followed them out to, to save Rosie. And Rosie's on her knees in front of Hardcase Williams, like, please, mister, please don't kill me. And a Abel calls and he turns his head and she grabs a hairpin, like a hair comb out of her hair and jabs it into his thigh and then kicks him in the hoolies and then knocks him out with a gun and then pretends to be all helpless. Abel shows up and she just faints and he lets her go. I think he, he she falls on him and they both go down in a heap. So they all go back to Marguerite's. Uh, Margarita makes them put uh, Hardcase Williams in her room. Abel's up at night in his room and he's thinking about the, the limerick and he's reciting it in his head and he starts to think back to when he first met Rosie. She was skinny dipping and they show a shot of her from the back and we see that she has a tattoo on her butt and then we cut to Margarita leaving him in the shower and they show the back of her and she's got a tattoo on her ass too. He ends up knocking both of the women out and they're on his bed, butts to the sky and he looks at the tattoos and he's like, and he runs off to the, the padre at the church and asks him for a map and he said of Chile Verde? He goes, no, of Scotland because there's going to be a map of Scotland in the middle of the Santa Fe Desert. You know what I'm saying? And then, of course, Abel, like, oh, I found it, Father, I found the gold. And he goes running off on his horse. The next thing is Hardcase Williams. Uh, he's more or less where Margarita left him. And where Margarita left him was tied to the bed with his pants down. She was going to cut off his manhood if he didn't tell her how Rosie had anything to do with this gold. And he says, oh, well, she's got a tattoo on her ass. And Margarita knows she has a tattoo on her ass, too. So she's, she's starting to, to put two and two together. And that's when she goes off and Abel knocks her unconscious. So Hardcase Williams hasn't seen her since then. Big Ed walks into the room. He's still tied to the bed there. Clearly, he has a heart on. And he says, it's not, you know, no need to point a finger. And she goes, well, at least that's all I'm, I'm pointing. And she unties him and they, fig they go running to... Abel's room and that's where they see Rosie and Margarita still unconscious, still naked. Big Ed goes to cover their butts and our case Williams slaps her hand and then she uncovers them again and they're looking at the tattoos and he gets this look on his face. He runs off to the priest. As Hardcase Williams goes tearing off, Margarita and Rosie come to and they're like, they get their butts together and they like, what is it? What is it? It's, well, it's a map. They go, we know it's a map, but of where? And she goes, Scotland. And they're looking at Ninfa. How do you know that Scotland? She goes, my third husband was from Scotland. He had a map just like it, but it was on the wall. And so Big Ed unties Margarita and Rosie, and they go tearing off. But as they're getting ready to go tearing off after Hardcase Williams, there's Ninfa running to, to get on a horse to, to go and get her chance at the gold, too, and they shoot her. <laughs> she says, they're not even going to put up with her. Done. Now everyone's in a mad dash to find this gold. We see Abel. He's at this grave site. Abel's dug down into the grave. There's no grave there, but there's this chest, and he pulls it out, and that's when Hardcase Williams reveals himself, and he's been there the whole time watching him dig the grave, figuring, well, why should I do any of the work? I'll let him do all the heart heavy lifting, and so he's got him at gunpoint and tells him to move off, and then that's when Rosie and Margarita show up. They've had this fight on horseback the whole way. In fact, it's Margarita that shows up first because she knocked Rosie off her horse as they're fighting. And everyone's saying to each other, I'll split it with you. I'll split it with you and blah, blah, blah. Rosie shows up. She's got her gun pulled. And the priest, the, the, the Father Garcia shows up and he's got them all at gunpoint. He's been a priest so long listening to all these people talk about this treasure. And now, now it's his and he'll take, he's going to travel the world and, and then finally visit Rome and maybe become the Pope. And while he's going off on this little pipe dream, they shoot him. <laughs> so now it's just the four of them and they keep kind of repositioning themselves. And before they shoot the priest, he tells them that Kaplan, that's the guy's name, he wanted the gold for his daughters. And they're like, what? And yeah, he tattooed the map on on each of their, so that their 
backside so they could collect the gold for themselves. And so now Rosie and Margarita realize that they're long lost sisters. And you can see that there's a little disgust there. You know, And so Rosie says, well, Margarita, our father wanted us to have it. So we should, we should stick together here. And hard case Williams, whenever he's around Rosie, starts sneezing because he's allergic to her perfume. So she whips out her bottle of perfume and starts spraying it at him. When he starts sneezing, they shoot him. He's out of the picture. So now it's Margarita and Rosie and Abel. And Margarita's the next one to get shot. Rosie shoots her and then says to Abel, it's just you and I. And he goes, then, then get rid of that. If, if it's just, if you just want this for us, and get rid of that gun. She does. She actually throws the gun away. So while Rosie's trying to express her undying love for Abel, Margarita comes to enough just to shoot Rosie. Doesn't she didn't kill her? I think she just shoots her in the stomach or something, and she unloads her gun into her. So she, now she's really dead, and clearly Rosie's like wounded, and she's like, "Oh, Abel, kiss me, Abel. Tell it. Tell me everything's gonna be." Right. And then she whips a gun out of her hair pulls it up close to his face and she's going to take it all and she gets shot again but this time it's like where, where did that come from it's big Ed up on the ridge and she's with her rifle and she says she was going to kill you i couldn't let that happen and he realizes that big ed was the one that saved him during the lynching so while they ride off together rosie comes to kind of and she's like oh abel Abel, don't leave me, Abel. I, I, I didn't mean it. I, I, you know, all of this. And they're, they're not even listening to her. They're just riding off. And she's got her gun. And you hear, you see Ed and Abel riding. And you hear this gunshot. And they clearly think that she's killed herself in desperation. And they continue on. We cut back to... Rosie, she's she looks like she's died. She's just sitting there, eyes closed, and all of a sudden she starts sniffing, and she looks down, and there's this vulture on a spit <laughs> roasting in a, in a campfire. She used her last bullet to catch lunch, and she starts eating it. And the last line of the, the movie, well, after all, tomorrow is another day. And that's lust in the dust. It's very dusty. It's very lusty. I'm, I'm never going to tell you it's a great movie to see but it's worth seeing if you're bored and have nothing to do or you want to see a, a, a classic divine performance where she's singing i'm actually i'm going to put a link to the song it's on youtube you can find it. i'm just going to put a link to it here for you even if you only see that part it's it's totally worth it so i think that i am ready for some lips and some hair and some eyelashes and i'll be right back <laughs> And there you go. That is Lust in the Dust. As I say, it's not a great film. I'm never going to tell you it should have won Oscars or got snubbed at any awards gala, but it certainly is a crowd pleaser. And because of Divine being in it, it is a cult classic that must be seen at least once. If it's something that you want to see, you can actually rent it on YouTube or actually buy a, a digital copy of it. Uh, I think it goes for rental for $4.99 and to own for $9.99. It is worth watching just for the musical numbers that both Lainey Kazan and Divine perform themselves. Now, as far as the Trixie Mattel products go, I want to start off by talking about the lip gloss. I am not a huge fan of lip, lip gloss. I find it gets, my wigs get stuck in it. It makes my mouth feel like it's covered in, in goo. That's not the case with this. I actually quite enjoy this lip gloss. This was purple. I, I went with the purple because I thought it would be a nice combination for the, the makeup on the face. Now, speaking of the makeup on the face, the winner of this family of products is the Summer of Love palette. This has three shades in it. We've got the highlighter, we've got the beautiful soft pink, and then the slapped butt red pink. Uh, I've used all three on my face. The highlighter itself has a nice pearly pink sheen to it. It goes really well with the blushes. And the pigments on these are spectacular. I quite like them. They're buildable. Uh, you can go from blushing bride to whore in as long as it as you want it to take you there. The other product I used was the new Trixie Mattel Bottle Blonde Palette. Now, I'm just going to say this. This is a good palette 
for real wear. I mean for day wear, walking in nature with children. If you want to throw on a nice little pink or purple tone to your office wear, or you just want to pretty up for your trip to the drugstore, the, the supermarket, whatever, this is a fantastic palette. If you're looking for a dramatic eye look for night or even for stage, this isn't going to give you as much impact. Even the black in this palette, which I'm glad Trixie put a black in, but this black looks green on camera. It doesn't go on as black as I would like it to. I actually had to dip into my uh, ColourPop Blowing Smoke palette just to get some really good black onto my eye because I found this one, it, blend, it blends so nicely with the others that it actually blends out. And I felt that it could very easily create more of a bruise look than a drama look. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, you want drama. You don't want to be the talk of drama. I'm just, I'm just saying. But it's an excellent palette. The colors all blend well. The pigments are good. But I wish the black was better or that Trixie hadn't bothered with the black and given us one other color with a little more pizzazz in it just to give us that option for something a little more dramatic. I think this is great for day. Maybe not so great for evening. I used the brown and uh, burgundy tones for my eyebrows and I think that they are spectacular. So it's a good palette. I'll definitely be using it again, but I think it's a palette that works better with some other palettes. So if you have a couple of bold colors and other palettes, this one's going to help you round out a look beautifully. And that's it for this week's Makeup and Movies. I hope you learned something. I hope I inspired you to watch Lust in the Dust. And if you haven't seen it, as I say, it's available on YouTube or wherever you like to stream movies. Well, that's not true. I don't know where you like to stream movies. I, I mostly check YouTube first. That's my go-to, <laughs> especially for obscure films like this one. So until next Friday, miss me. Mwah! Seriously. It's a good, it's a good palette. I enjoyed it. I just don't have a job in a bank. That's my problem. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.